This is the Magic Word Podcast.com. Hello, this is Scott Wells for the Magic Word Podcast.com. This week's episode is brought to you by our sponsor, The Wonder Bash, which is a convention that's coming up in Grand Rapids, Michigan, April the 18th through the 20th. It's just right around the corner. You don't want to miss it. And you can go to get more information by visiting this website, which is morethantricks.com. Again, that's morethantricks.com for The Wonder Bash, April 18th through the 20th. This week, we're going to be speaking with someone who I consider an everyman magician. In other words, he is a little bit of everything, uh, which uh, actually represents many of the magicians I know who are listeners out there, those who are just plugging at it all the time. You find something that you really enjoy and you make a living of, and that's exactly what Keith Leff has done. Keith is my guest this week from Kansas City, Missouri, and he had made his uh, avocation into a full-time vocation which he truly enjoys. Not only is he a restaurant magician, but then a corporate magician and doing trade shows and uh, festivals, uh, state fairs, things like that. Anyhow, he's doing a little bit of everything and whatever that it takes, I guess. But he also has a, a very good lecture in which he talks about some of his commercial and clever and creations uh, that will work for whether it's in a restaurant or in a cocktail strolling environment or something like that. And I recently caught up with him uh, following one of his lectures that he had given when he was in the area here. And again, I feel that he kind of represents the uh, the general population of magicians who really enjoy it. They could be hobbyists. They could be someone who is working as uh, Kate, Keith is, as a full-time professional magician, but just keep plugging at it. He's not necessarily a well-known celebrity magician of someone who you have heard of. Uh, I, I wouldn't. I don't want to say that he's common. I would just say that he, nor average. He is above average. I would just say that he is uh, someone who you may not know or nor have heard of until you hear this week's podcast. I do want to thank him very much for joining us here this week and for being a guest because he is uh, someone that has some some good advice that is well worth hearing and adhering to that he's going to share with us here this week. So please welcome my guest, Mr. Keith Leff here on The Magic Word. Keith Leff is a magician from the Kansas City, Missouri area. And I always like to uh, talk with people from time to time who are really kind of the backbone, the guys who are out there working uh, and uh, making their bread and butter from doing these kinds of magic shows, whether it's going to be for restaurants and corporate work, uh, doing whatever it takes in order to entertain the public and as a byproduct, make a little bit of money then as well. Uh, in addition to that, he's been doing some uh, lectures around the country and uh, he had come through our area recently. And so I thought you might enjoy here having a perspective from the common working man, the magician. Here he is, Keith left. Hey there, Keith. Hi, Scott. Thanks for having me on. Good to have you here then as well. I know that you've been working for quite some time and doing a lot of restaurants and everything else. And a lot of us have a lot of background where we can say, well, I worked on cruise ships or, you know, corporate deals or birthday parties, et cetera, et cetera. And it sounds like that you in your background have done a little bit of all of that as well. Yes. Yes, as a full-time professional, I pretty much have been in any and every venue you can imagine. <laughs> has there has there been something, I mean, like with me, I used to do uh, doves and rabbits and livestock, and I did illusions, and a little at a time as I've gotten older, I uh, started scaling down and getting smaller and smaller and getting rid of the mm -hmm. uh, the, the live animals, et cetera. Uh, have you gotten to a point where that you have tried a little bit of everything, but then started to get to a point where you are now satisfied with a, a more of a niche area or niche type of magic that you like to do? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think close up is probably my forte, uh, sleight of hand type magic uh, with, with cards and coins, everyday objects, uh, things that are organic. Um, I've, I've gotten away from from prop based magic where the prop does the magic for you. Right. Uh, and I think everyone, magicians and laymen alike, appreciate the skill and talent required to be able to do uh, sleight of hand, you know, with borrowed objects or, you know, seemingly impromptu or um, really impromptu types of, uh, of apparatus, uh, or I shouldn't say apparatus, that's what the kind of magic I'm trying to get away from, but just, you know, things that people are familiar with, cards, coins, uh, dollar bills, uh, you know, straws, 
uh, you know, I've, especially since I have a restaurant background, I do things with, uh, you know, objects that are found in a restaurant. I do silverware bins, uh, you know, salt shaker effects, effects with sugar packets, signed coins end up in sugar packets and things like that. Um, but yeah, I, I've done it all. I, I used to eat fire and you know, I used to do a fire eating act. I, you know, I, I used to produce live doves in my show as well. And, uh, you know, this day and age, uh, it's, it, you know, it's really, I'm hard pressed to find a venue that'll allow open flames or live mm. animals. And Good so, point. um, I've got, I've had four birds in my dove act at one point in time, and I'm just down to one bird now, yeah. you know, uh, and I kind of keep her as a pet more than anything. I mean, she used to earn her keep, you know, uh, but, but she's, I guess she's retired now since there's a no live animal clause in most of the corporate venues I go to. So did you have a, an assistant that uh, helped you or did you do this in one? Uh, no, I had an assistant for a short period of time. Um, but yeah, it was, it was mostly just uh, mostly just a one man show. So and did you develop uh, she, the act for a contest or for actual um, corporate work? No, I just thought it would be really cool to, you know, to have, I mean, you know, I think a lot of magicians, I don't know how they get into the dove magic. I mean, of course, Lance Burton was definitely an influence. Um, you know, there was another local guy here that did a really uh, solid act with some doves. And I thought that is so cool. I want to do that. And so, you know, I got a dove and then I got two doves, um, smoke and mirrors were their names. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, then I ended a couple, I added a couple more birds. I, I got an, I, I can, I know a lot more about doves than I ever planned on <laughs> learning. So <laughs> yeah, I know if I bit off more than I can chew, but, uh, but it was a lot of fun. It was just, it, the audiences just loved, you know, loved the doves and the live animals. I think it just kind of really added a different dynamic to the show. Um, so I enjoyed it while I, while I was doing it, but, in Have some it. parts of the country, and I've talked with some people in the past who said they've actually used uh, doves in restaurants for walk around. Uh, yeah, now, I've heard of that. I, I, I think it's kind of strange because most places I have ever been will not allow animals of any kind. I mean, unless it's a service animal, you know. Yeah, <laughs> that's. Uh, I don't think I would ever do that. I mean, doves, their feathers fly off. Um, yeah, and you got they that poop dust. It will. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> I just think it would be a sanitation uh, thing more than anything. Uh, you know, I don't know why. Um, yeah, better to be safe than sorry. So that's kind of the way that I uh, see it then as well. Well, when you were uh, developing that, did you ever take that to contests? To um, yeah, I, I I did it here at a local contest, um, the, the uh, local IBM Ring One Twenty Nine contest. Um, I did that. Um, it was funny too, because, uh, I did my fire eating and my doves. It was, it was a beautiful, um, number. It's all, it was all choreographed to music. I did some ball manipulations. Uh, the, the fat, the last ball changed into a silk. And then I, I did the crystal tube where three silks go into the tube. They end up being tied together. Um, then I produced my first dove and then put the silks in a, in a fire dove bag, produced the second dove. Um, but anyway, it was, it was interesting. I, I, I should, I was told I should have won. I, I think I would have won first place, but I was disqualified for using fire in the act. <clears throat> and the chairman of the, the committee, uh, contest chairman, uh, you know, asked me why I did that. And I said, well, I, there, you know, there was, I didn't know there was a no fire clause because, you know, one of my mentors used to do fire eating in the contests all the time. And he said, oh, I sent you an email. And I said, oh, I, no, you didn't. And he said, yes, I did. And I said, well, I didn't get it. And it was interesting because all the other performers apparently were <laughs> aware of the no fire clause. And they saw my torches and my lighter fluid on my table backstage. Nobody said anything. I of guess they were not. wanting to me to disqualify myself. Uh, so then the next day I got a, a long email with the chairman profusely apologizing because the email was sitting in his drafts and he never sent it. So. Uh -huh. <laughs> But uh, it's interesting you bring that up because I was thinking about maybe doing that again this year uh, for the contests. I, uh, you know, I've always qualified to perform in regional, you know, national, local contests. I've uh, been quite a few of them, won quite a few of them. Um, but a lot of times I end up getting a gig at the last minute or, you know, shortly there before the, the contest is is uh, held. But, but yeah, I was, I've been thinking about maybe doing the act again this year, uh, minus the fire eating. Uh, adding something else to that uh, for our stage contest here in Kansas City, but that that remains to be seen. <laughs> that's what I was going to ask you about the fire eating. If that's been something or not, just fire in general. Uh, I assume the rules are still the same. They haven't loosened those. Uh, no, there's still no fire. It makes um, sense. Was, Years yeah. ago, I stopped uh, using fire in my act. I used to as well when I do a. Uh, a burn bill routine for an example or a cigarette mm -hmm. through coat that was terry seabrook's i mean that was uh, a standard in my show for a long time until i 
finally couldn't find anybody who had cigarettes or if they did, they wouldn't admit yeah. they were smoking when I'd ask for one, you know? So I used to actually <laughs> bring my own cigarettes and I would say, okay, we well, you know, I do happen to have one. And uh, then I would go through with the routine, but then it got so close with the smoke detectors. That was the issue of no, I wanted to mm-hmm. set that off. And that can be a real problem if you're <laughs> in a banquet room and you are doing a, a, a burn bill routine and all of a sudden everybody gets soaked. Yeah, um, I've always was paranoid about that. I always would like, you know, light the torch and kind of hold it up there for a longer period of time than what it would normally be lit during the routine. But uh, fortunately, I never had any issues with that. But I'm sure that's probably happened to some people and that would not be good. Well, there's a new thing now. Uh, I say new. It's been around for a while that some places have in which there are laser uh, beams, apparently. And if you uh, if smoke or something crosses that beam anywhere, because I guess it's going back and forth rapidly. Uh, so that way they don't have to have smoke alarms. They just have this beam. And if something breaks the beam, basically, that mm-hmm. sets off the, the uh, smoke or the fire alarm, basically. Oh, wow. Um, and uh, I, the reason I know that is because that happened at a show I was in. Oh, uh, one time at a place not to be named right now, but anyhow, I had moved something on stage and whenever I did, I put this potted plant and this potted plant was taller than, I mean, you were first of all elevated on the stage. And then the next thing, of course, then the uh, the plant was taller than anybody else who would be on the stage and that apparently broke the the, uh, the beam. And all of a sudden the fire department showed up and, you know, there was no fire or anything, but oh th- there was still a, an issue. And they said, well, we'll give you a pass this time. But uh, they had not, uh, they had signed a contract saying there would be no smoke or fire, which there wasn't any smoke or fire, but they didn't <laughs> say anything about that so that's always something no more else potted plants no more no more tall <laughs> did the sprinklers plants. go off no they did not all they oh, did I was, gonna was say at least the plant got watered <laughs> the sprinklers <laughs> didn't go off a <laughs> good point of course it was uh, i think just an artificial plant so it was just artificial rain that was coming down or you know water that was <laughs> that was getting us wet i know you've been working in restaurants then for a long time then as well and but getting into the uh that business to begin with were you doing that on a part-time basis then finally moved into uh doing that doing magic i mean most people have that route they go as opposed to jumping right in or being full-time magician from the time they get out of school mm-hmm. but what was your path uh, as far as restaurants go? Well, not necessarily. I, uh, I kind of mm-hmm. want to go back just uh, before that, before restaurants. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I was, uh, you know, I'm, I'm probably like most other people. You know, I started doing birthday parties, you know, when I was a kid, you know. Sure. Uh, I, uh, you know, uh, got into magic real seriously. Um, I would say, uh, you know, when I was a teen, uh, I had a couple of mentors. Uh, you know, I was doing uh, part-time gigs. Uh, in high school, when I got to college, uh, I was a bartender and I uh, I learned real fast. I could make a hundred bucks a night in tips uh, bartending, or I could make, you know, over $300 a night in tips bartending, doing magic behind the bar. Mm-hmm. Um, and so uh, I did that. Um, you know, when I, uh, around that time, after I graduated college, I ended up getting uh, my first restaurant gig <clears throat> and um, did that just one night a week for a long time. Uh, and then in 2000, uh, I went to my first magic convention. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I'm just like a lot of people. I always wanted to be like a magician for, you know, a living. I wanted to be a magician when I grew up. Um, and I saw guys because I was under the impression that you had to be like a David Blaine or, you know, a, a David Copperfield to, to become a professional magician. Uh, and I saw guys at this convention doing what I do now, you know, making a really nice living, uh, just doing corporate stuff. And I, you know, I, I'm like, wow, I could do that, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, and so I was working at Sprint at the time. And, uh, you know, I went back to, to my job and, you know, sitting behind a desk nine to five. And I just, after being at that magic convention, I just, my heart wasn't in it anymore. Uh, I, I just couldn't do it. And I had to take a leap of faith. And, you know, one of my mentors told me, he said, follow your heart and the money will follow. Uh, so I resigned from a really good job at Sprint and uh, started Magic Creations back in 2000 uh, and really kind of never looked back. Um, at that time, um, I, I started prospecting more restaurants and I was actually working uh, six nights a week in, in six different restaurants. Uh, one of those being Old Shawnee Pizza, uh, which is a restaurant I still work at to this day. I've uh, been there for over 30 years, uh, minus, you know, the two years in the pandemic. Um, and so, yeah, you know, a lot of guys will will start off in magic 
or they'll start off professionally, you know, when they want to start doing a, doing it full time, they'll, they'll either go like, you know, the street route doing street magic or they'll get restaurant gigs. Uh, and like I talk about in my lecture, for me, I, I chose the restaurant path because uh, I don't have to worry about getting a crowd, building a crowd, uh, keeping a crowd, um, you know, as, passing the hat at the end of the act. I didn't have to worry about the elements, um, you know, things like that, whether we're in the restaurant, you know, I know I'm going to get paid. I'm going to get a complimentary meal at the end of my shift. Um, it was a little more professional, so I was going to get more bookings that way, uh, you know, networking at the restaurant. Um and, you know, I didn't have to worry about the elements. So that's why uh, I kind of went down the restaurant path. Did you say working, worrying about the elements then? Did you ever do very much uh, street magic? Yeah, I've done street magic. Um, I did that, you know, as well. But, um, you know, I just, it wasn't really my niche. I mean, I, you know, I was performing it. I performed a lot of fairs and festivals as well. It was kind of a niche market for a while. As a and, character? Uh, as a uh, no, character or anything? No, I actually, um, you know, it's funny when I was in the, the Turner Festival market, I, I didn't have much success just doing a general comedy magic show. <laughs> and I put together a show for uh, one of my agents booked me for uh, a, an event in Junction City, Kansas called the Sundown Salute. It was a Fourth of July celebration. And uh, I thought, you know, I'm going to put together a patriotic themed show. Um, it was all red, white and blue props, red, white, and blue costuming. Uh, all scripted out. Uh, I talked about American history, the signing of the Declaration of Independence, mm -hmm. um, the colors of the flag, what they mean, what the flag represents. Uh, did a full-on tribute to the troops during the show. Because, uh, you know, a couple of guys that were having success in the market kind of had a niche. One of them kind of had like an old Western medicine type show. Um, and, then, you know, he told me, he said, you're too corporate. You need to come up with a hook for your fair and festival market. So when I came up with that patriotic themed act, uh, it kind of took the fair and festival market by storm. Uh, it was a wildly popular um, act. Uh, I mean, I took it all over the country. And so, you know, I spent so much time and money and energy and effort in scripting this show out and creating all the props and getting the costuming together. Uh, I thought, you know, instead of just doing it that weekend on the 4th of July, I'll just do it the whole summer. Uh, and that whole summer, just uh, I showcased it at some of the fair and festival conventions uh, and the agents were kind of mad because usually <laughs> the fair and festival fair board members will go to these conventions to book bands mostly first and foremost. And then, uh, cause they're more expensive than us variety acts. Right. Um, and then if they have money left over, they'll book a variety act. Well, I had a line at my booth, uh, right after I showcased, you know, <laughs> nobody went to the, the agent's booths. Nobody went to the band's booths. Uh, I had a line <laughs> at my booth a mile long and I, they were I booking you time. direct rather than going through the page agents then. Yeah. Yeah. Well, my agent, you know, he called me up one day. He's like, Hey, can you be in Topeka, Kansas tonight and do 20 minutes? Uh, I didn't know these fair and festival conventions existed. So I went and did that. Uh, nobody had seen me before I was the new kid on the block and he booked like 26 fairs for me, I think that year. Hmm. Uh, and he was mostly in the business of booking bands. Um, anytime he needed a variety act, he would, he would book me, but I said, Hey, do you mind if I would come here and represent myself? You know, and he said, sure. And so, you know, I did that. You know, you know the guy that told me I needed to come, come up with a niche, uh, he would kind of regretted that because he created some serious competition for him because, <laughs> you know, he he had a almost like a monopoly on on variety acts in that market at the time. So, but anyway, how many years did you uh, do that uh, festivals and things? Um, I don't know, probably maybe a good ten years. That's so. a, a really a niche area. Yeah, that's not just street magic and it's certainly not restaurant magic and it's it's its own kind of a thing in its own culture where these people travel from one place to the other and live in tents or you know mm -hmm. because they're mainly weekend kinds of things or maybe three-day weekends uh, uh, but it goes on anywhere from six to eight weeks or something so did mm -hmm. you then come back home then during the week or do you stay there or do you just live in a tent or um, the, yeah it just kind of depend it's, uh you know i mean sometimes uh, fairs were like week longs or state fairs were like 10 days long Long. Uh, sometimes it's just you know uh, a one day fair or whatever. So I just you know there's there's a, there's stretches where uh, I'm you know I'm gone for you know weeks at a time and you know sometimes I'd be able to make a pit stop back home and uh, sometimes just you know living on the road. That's that's kind of the nature of the business. <clears throat> Well, yeah, unlike a, a restaurant or someplace where you're going to be having a uh, regular job, if you will, that was going to be kind of that mm -hmm. way. Because I was wondering if you're one of those 50 milers, just kind of stayed within 50 miles of your uh, of, of your home, basically. Uh, but it sounds like that you kind of go outside of that area. Although of, of late, have you kind of stayed more within your home area? 
Uh, no, not necessarily. I mean, I, I go coast to coast. Um, okay. You know, like I tell people, I have magic wand, will travel. Um, so, you know, I'm not like, the, uh, you know, uh, David Copperfield where people can come see me. I have to, I have to go to see them. Sure. But uh, the other reason I brought up the fairs and festivals is because I, you know, I do, I would do that, that patriotic theme show. It was called the uh, uh, prestigious patriotic prestidigitation performance. And uh, but I'd also do roving magic, the sleight of hand style magic, which is like the street style magic as well uh -huh. uh, for that. But uh, but, you know, it's funny. <clears throat> we're talking about, you know, doves and, and fire and stuff. And it's like the older I get, um, the, the less it's it's involved with my show. I mean, I have a briefcase I can go anywhere in the country with. And I just work right out of the briefcase that, you know, it goes up on a stand, yeah. uh, you know, pack flat, play big. Uh, and that briefcase, that briefcase gets lighter and lighter and lighter each year. Um, you know, I think uh, what well, John Carney is one of my favorite magicians. And, and he said something one time at a lecture that really stuck with me. And he said, he who does the most with the least wins. Right. That's exactly <laughs> so right. I, I've definitely adopted that uh, mentality, especially since, you know, uh, just, you know, carry on a briefcase and go anywhere with it. So that's what I was saying about earlier is how that I've cut back a little bit at a time such that I don't do any live animals or big illusions and doing, you know, pack flat, play big kind of thing. Uh, and depending more upon the presentation, um, because I remember talking with Fielding West about what he said, what was in your act? And I was saying this, this, and this, and after a while, so how long is that? Like two hours, you know, because <laughs> I'd listed 18 things or something, you uh -huh. know, it's just, uh, you need to cut a lot of things out and just, and script the things that you've got to make them more interesting yeah. and entertaining, you know, exactly uh, kind of a thing. Uh, going back to, again to the fairs, rent fairs and things like that. How are you paid? And that I'm, I'm, I'm I've not worked with a rent fair or anything uh, or state fairs. In that case, are you paid by the fair and do you get tipped or do they give you a low fee figuring you're going to get a lot of tips or is it tips only? No, no, no. It's, I mean, like I said, uh, you know, it's, it's almost like doing street magic at the fair sometimes when you're doing the roving, you know, walk around magic. But I mean, I just, I'm not there to collect tips. I get paid very well uh, by the fair board. Uh, you know, the, the, there's like fair boards have treasurers, vice presidents, you know, mm -hmm. um, chairman, managers, they have entertainment uh, chairs and things like that. So, uh, so yeah, I'm just paid by the, by the fair board. But are you talking more now about county and state fairs as opposed to, let's right. say, Renaissance fairs and things? Yeah, well, you know, the local Renaissance Festival here in Kansas City is a great uh, festival. Um, you know, they, they've approached me numerous times to, you know, want me to be out there to to do magic at the Renaissance Festival. But they, they don't pay anything. There's no stipend whatsoever. That's what it's I thought. Just, strip, just strictly they, you... tips only. And, you know, you have to commit to being there every weekend for, you know, quite a few weeks. And I just can't do that. You know, I can't, you know, turn down a high dollar corporate gig for, you know, going out in the Renaissance Festival, you know, passing okay. a hat. So well, that clarifies <laughs> it. That that's uh, much makes much more sense. I was yeah. uh, misunderstanding. I thought that you were saying kind of lumping those all together. But you're talking about really because I, when I was saying going out on the road and being gone for a long time and sleeping in tents, it, that's what the Ren Fair people do, you know. Like, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, when I'm when I'm doing fairs and festivals, they put me up in a hotel. Sure. The, I, the no, fair no, board does, makes, you know, they complete pay sense. mileage and pay for the hotel or airfare. So. Yeah, different kinds of uh, fairs that, uh, and, and not the uh, Ren fair type of a thing. Well, on, as far as the restaurants go, uh, certainly that there are different types of restaurants uh, in which that you would have like a family friendly restaurant, uh, some that are more uh, fern and brass and steakhouse kind of a place that's more mm -hmm. upscale. Uh, and some of those, in my experience, has been harder to get into. And that is the, uh, the ones that are... Uh, that have the higher dollar uh, whether they have a family, they're just trying to keep people moving through. But when they have a higher dollar thing, they're trying to keep people seated there. They really don't want the magician seems like coming in. It's hard. It's a, a harder, harder sell. Have you noticed that to be the case? Um, not really. I mean, I've, you know, I've been, I've probably been at 25 different restaurants in 25 years and uh, some of them are family friendly. Some of them were nice upper scale, like steakhouses. Um, I don't know if it's necessarily, I mean, some of them, you know, they, of course, you know, everyone has this preconceived notion that magic's for kids. And so it's kind of hard to overcome that stereotype when an owner or manager is like, well, that's not really, you know, that doesn't fit into our concept. And then I'm, you know, I pitch a free trial night. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously my presentation is going to be different for a family friendly restaurant when there's kids there versus, you know, adults only for those types of venues. Um, so, you know, seeing is believing and, you know, they see 
uh, you know, you're doing classy, elegant, magic, sophisticated, sleight of hand kind of stuff. Uh, they usually tend well, you know, after you do a free trial night, they usually tend to want to, to try it out on a, you know, a, at least a short term, if not a long term basis. I think it's really more based on also the uh, not only like I can talk about in my lecture, the location of the restaurant, the venue, but mainly the clientele, but also uh, the cuisine. I mean, pizza places are great uh, to do restaurant magic in because there's a long wait for the pizza. Uh, steakhouses as well. Um, you know, the the higher end of the, the, the higher end the restaurant is, the typically the longer the wait is. And so that's good for restaurant magic as far as being able to help the customers kill time where they're waiting for the food to come out. Uh, conversely, like uh, Mexican places are horrible, horrible places. Uh, I have worked at a couple uh, and the food comes out so quickly that you just don't have time to entertain the guests. I mean, there was one uh, up at an outside mall here in Kansas City and Zona Rosa called uh, Abuelo's Mexican Food Embassy. And it was a real nice high-end Mexican place. And I worked there for several years because um, the wait was a lot, you know, a lot longer than the typical Mexican restaurant would be. Uh, and also the clientele makes a difference as to who's going to be booking you because you were saying earlier about making contacts that you can then parlay into uh, shows. And it, it seems like that if you're working a pizza place, they're going to be saying, oh, you know, will you do Johnny's birthday party? As opposed to if you're at a steakhouse, they're going to be saying, hey, we got a trade show coming up. Right. Well, it depends too. I mean, yeah, you know, I've, I've booked high-end corporate gigs at pizza places as well. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that's why I, I kind of gravitated towards the higher end kind of places, um, you know, because it's you, you get the higher end bookings that way because, you know, you have a lot of business people that are coming in there. Uh, you know, every table I'm at gets a business card uh, mm -hmm. and I, get, I always hand it out in a magical fashion. Usually it's got like a, you know, a foot long flame coming off of it. It's kind of my tagline. One of my uh, things I say is I pull out this flaming business card and I say I'm uh, I'm the hottest magician in the Midwest and I blow it out and then I hand it to them. Um, so, you know, they remember that. So I just, like I say in my lecture, uh, you know, always hand your business card out in a magical fashion, whether you back palm it, you know, there's a lot of great marketed effects out there as far as getting your business card um, to people. Also, uh, if they ask for my card, I will ask for their card in return because chances are they have a, a, a gig in mind that they want to book you for. So, um, you know, I don't do business in the restaurant. I, I do business. Uh, I mean, I, I network at the restaurant, but I don't I'm not there at the restaurant to get I mean, I'm there to get bookings, but I'm not mm -hmm. there to do business on the restaurant's time. Like I don't talk about you know, booking gigs or how much I charge, you know, a lot of people will say, Hey, what do you charge for this? And I say, well, you know, it depends on if you want strolling uh, stage. I also do a lot of inspirational speaking uh, engagements using magic with meaning magic with a message type of keynote presentations. Uh, I do an extensive trade show work as well. So I don't know what they need. So that's why I tell them, Hey, just, you know, give me a call or I'll shoot you an email. Uh, and we can talk about what it is that, that I can help you out with. So on the but I don't occasions. want to do business on the restaurant's time because there's other tables waiting for entertainment there. Well, exactly right. Yeah. And you, you're there really to entertain uh, and soliciting business is a side benefit and a, a big side benefit. And, and yeah. ultimately, I think one of the two reasons that people would want to do restaurants, one would be to get some experience and try some new things and get your timing down and everything. Oh, yeah. And then the other would be, of course, then to uh, uh, to get new clients. In that case, uh, when you're doing it, I uh, what do you do? Like, I'll tell you what I do. Um, when they don't have a card. In other words, uh, if you got a business, I put my business cards out to begin with as I start. So that way that they can reach and take one without saying anything. But uh, if they do, then I'm going to say, you know, can I have one of your cards? And it seems like nine times out of 10 said, no, you don't have one on me. I, mm -hmm. I would then have a uh, uh, pencil and paper or pull out something, you know, just to mm -hmm. uh, say, well, can can you jot your email down or phone number so this way I can keep your contact information? Mm -hmm. How do you get around that when they don't have a card? I do the same thing. Okay. I mean, I have, you know, uh, business cards. Some of them have uh, things printed on the back, but I always have some blank ones that I use. Uh, uh -huh. That way I can jot down their information, get their contact information. So, yeah. Well, I, I'm just wondering today how relevant business cards really are because uh, I use I use a digital card basically yeah. where you can tap and has all your information on that. Are you finding more mm -hmm. and more of that to be the case too? Yeah, yeah, that is definitely the case. I mean, <laughs> you know, business cards were a thing in the past, and it's too bad because there's so many great tricks you can do with business oh, sure. cards out there on the market. Like I said earlier, but 
you know, it's just like newspapers, you know, the torn and restored newspaper, Gene Anderson, torn and restored newspaper is such a great trick, but, but nobody reads newspapers anymore, you know, well, and, and it's, and it's, and it's sad too, because a lot of people don't carry cash. I do some really strong magic uh, with some, with cash, you know, mm -hmm. it's obviously, and, and ha it has an inherited value to it. So you're obviously uh, capturing people's interest because you're borrowing their money. Uh, but a lot of times nobody has, no, nobody has cash anymore. So yeah, it's a, uh, it's, you know, it's a different age. It's a different world that we live in. Like you were talking about cigarette magic, you know, I used to do the old cigarette through quarter back in the day. I used to smoke back in the day, you know, like 28 <laughs> years ago, I quit smoking 28 years ago. You know, I sold all my all my cigarette tricks, you know. Yeah. Well, ago, so. I hadn't thought so much about uh, the cashless society that we're in. I haven't worked restaurants in a few years. Uh, I've worked restaurants for 20, 25 years uh, regularly, but haven't now for quite some time. But I would think, yes, that we are more in a cashless society where everyone is using PayPal, Venmo and everything else, which gets me to the point as far as uh, getting tips. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you have like a little... Uh, QR code or something that you um, just say, you know, here's, you know, put that on the side of your mat or on the table or whenever you're performing. And if, if people, you know, want to tip you, they can scan that and send something to you. You know, that's funny. I, uh, I do, I carry one in my wallet now just because, and, and you know, soliciting tips has never been my style. Uh, you know, I don't want to feel like I'm there to pressure people for exactly. tips, you know, right. um, I just want to be, enter I just want to entertain people. You know, I think if you're, if you're getting in the restaurant business to make a lot of tips, then, you know, um, you, you know, might want to rethink that. But yeah, I mean, sometimes you don't get a tip at all. Sometimes you get a really nice tip. I mean, the biggest tip I ever got was like $257 mm -hmm. uh, monetarily speaking. But then I also got a little drawing from a little girl, um, you know, that she wanted to make a drawing for me, you know, to show her appreciation. Uh, yep. for the magic I did at her table. And that was just as meaningful as the, as the money, to, the, monetary, the monetary tip. But, you know, it's so funny because a lot of uh, people, a lot of customers like, hey, do you, uh, you know, do you take Venmo? And and, and another magician of mine, uh, he works restaurants and he, he's like, yeah, getting this uh, all the time. And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, you know, I, I just can't bring myself to put a QR code on the back of my business card, you know, because um, hmm. it's just, you know, I mean, I don't know if I'd make more money doing that, but like I said, it's just never been my style, uh, you know, to try to, to try to hustle people for tips. Um, you know, I always just say, you know, it's compliments of the house. Um, if people ask me, am I, am I supposed to tip you? You know, I say it's always appreciated, never expected, uh, that kind of thing. But that's, this is kind of my philosophy on, on tipping. Um, but you know, you had, you had mentioned earlier about, you know, restaurants, uh, getting into restaurants, you know, practicing, getting your material honed. Um, you know, that's a, that's another one of the great benefits of restaurant magic is just you get so tight, your 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 effects become so polished and so perfected because you're doing them over and over and over again. It's a great way to break in new material. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're, I mean, it's forcing you to always be creative because you always have to come up with new stuff. I always rotate stuff in and out. Um, one thing I, I do want to say is I'm very adamant about this. You know, I've heard people say that restaurants are a great place to get paid to practice and that just makes my skin crawl because you know practice is done at home you know you have practice that just as when you acquire musculature memory uh you have practice where you're just getting the moves down uh then you have intellectual intelligent practice where you're coming up with the scripts and the pattern that you come up with and then you move to rehearsal you know in front of a live person preferably a video camera um you know get that tight get that down and then go do it in the restaurant, you know, you don't go to a restaurant to practice, go to a restaurant to get polished is, is what I like to say. So you're really idea. doing magic a disservice. I think if you're just out, especially, you know, those of us that do restaurant magic full-time or part-time or make our living doing restaurant magic, um, you know, it just does, it does a, a discredit to people that are out there just, you know, they're just winging it. You know, they're just going out there. They, they buy a new trick. They go to the, you know, so I think some of the magic shops, which are, you know, few and far between now, brick and mortar magic shop, you know, you buy a magic shop, you know, get your business cards printed there at the magic shop. And then you go out that night and start doing gigs, you know, <laughs> you know, there's uh, even stuff that's self-working or stuff that, you know, the, the, the people, the magic dealers are like, no practice, no, no practice required, no skill required. I'm like that just, that always, that has always bothered me. <laughs> well, I agree. Uh, that's, that's true. Uh, there's something that you don't buy today and perform tonight. 
kind of a thing. Yeah. And uh, some people might look at a restaurant that way, say, oh, this is a cool trick. However, there are some things, as we were talking about earlier, you talk about some boxes or tricks that are, quote, self-working to a degree. That is that you really don't have to do anything but put the presentation into it. And there are some close-up effects that are kind of like that, uh, mm -hmm. that don't require necessarily a lot of practice. And it would make sense if you buy something, let's say, for an example, the 52-on-1 card, right? Mm -hmm there's, I mean, it is what it is. There is no sleight of hand. You just turn around the card, your right. card's right here, or whatever. It's a joke card kind of a thing. Yeah. So you can buy all the time. that. Exactly. You can buy that kind of a thing today and put it in the show tonight and work on your routine and what kind of response you get back from people who might give you some of your better lines that you'll end up putting in. So there are some things that oh, are yeah. kind of like that, that I would say are well, kind of self-working that perhaps that you could do. But for the most part, you're right. This is something that you should polish at home uh, it, to a point where you've got all the rough edges off and then you can make it into a diamond once that you actually start performing in front of people. Yeah. Yeah, I actually have a 53-on-one card. It has the Joker on there. And I have that printed on the back of my business card. Mm -hmm. uh, and I use it all the time, but uh, I just pull it out. You know, I say name a card. Uh, you don't, don't get cute and say Larry or Bob or Susan. No one should name like a real legitimate playing card. They say the seven of clubs. I say, how amazing would it be if I turned this card over and showed you the seven of clubs? There it is. Boom. They think it, the trick's over. And I do this as a closer, right? Because I say, that was the comedy. Here comes the magic. And so I say, you know, earlier when I approach a table, I say, I do comedy magic. So basically anything I say that's not funny is magic. <laughs> and uh, so then I do the gag, but then I pull my brainwave deck out and, and, blow their minds with that, you know, because the seven of clubs is not only the only face up card in the deck, but it's also the only odd colored match card. Uh, and oftentimes I open with a uh, Chicago opener. Uh, I do uh, Bill Malone's version of mind reading magician. So you have a, you know, the, the red deck with the blue card. And then, so at the end, you know, I have a, a blue deck with a red card. So it kind of makes a nice little book in there. When I uh -huh. do that. So that's one of those things I use, like I said, and when I, when I like about that too, is I give them that, I give them the business card and I say, and that's not a business card with a magic trick on the back. That is a magic trick you can do for your friends, family, neighbors, and coworkers that just happens to have my contact information printed on the other side. You know, so, right. And so that way, you know, people come into a restaurant all the time. Hey, I did that. I did that for my nephew last week. He thought it was hilarious, you know. So. <laughs> they will carry that card with him for a long time. I've known, a, oh, yeah. I've seen those on the back of uh, not many, but a few uh, guys who are pros. Mm -hmm. And I really say that because they are pros they they yeah. know the value of marketing and how that you can give out something and that was another thing i was going to ask you about and that is gift magic like jeff mcbride would talk about where you actually give something um mm -hmm. th uh, to someone so this way a lot of times if you give somebody they feel like they have to give something back to you that's not the reason that you'll be giving it out of course mm -hmm. you're doing it because out of the magnanimity mag, mag out of the goodness of your heart <laughs> uh, easy that, for you to say that's right <laughs> magnanimity of uh, your heart that you could actually give this out and the, be, because you want to share this with someone, but oftentimes they'll say, oh, you know, here, take this, you know, they'll give you, you know, something uh, which is far in excess of the value of what you have given them. Although you've given them the joy of this experience at the table. I used to give out uh, mind reading fish, you know, in the palm oh, yeah. of your hands. Um, yeah. And uh, there's some great tricks you can do with that in which that you would have a, you know what the card's going to be. They could be on their hand. Um, and, um, you have the uh, the fish on their hand and then the card face down that's underneath. And so you can say, well, uh, which is underneath their palm. And as the fish will curl one way or the other, you say, well, it's a red card, it's a diamond or whatever, and then reveal it, turn it over and say, you know, with a little bit of practice, you can do that too. You can keep that one, you know, as well. So they feel like that they've got not only just a, a mind reading fish, but also but maybe something they could, it might be a trick that they could figure out and can't. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah, those are great. I used to give those out. Uh, I do the pearl poodles all the time. Yep. Uh, those are great. I have a nice, funny routine I do with that. Um, I make the little, I have an origami uh, thing I do with a dollar bill. Uh, and I give these out for special occasions or, you know, sometimes if they just give me a, a good tip, I'll, I'll give them one of those. It looks like a top hat. 
and then you squeeze the sides of it and a bunny pops up. So the rabbit mm -hmm. comes out of the hat. Mm -hmm. uh, I make those when I go out to, to eat. I keep them in my wallet. I give them to servers when I'm out dining at restaurants as well. Um, I've used the little wooden round to it, which are great because mm -hmm. um, I can manipulate those like I would a coin do magic with those and hand them out and say, give me a call if you ever get a round to it because on the back of it, it says to it. So right. um, I've used those as well. Um, you know, all, 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 all kinds of, uh, you know, novelty items, uh, little magic wands that have my name and uh, website, uh, phone number printed on them. Um, I, you know, the pointless pencils. I love the pointless pencils. Mm -hmm. You know, I give those out and I'll say this, you know, uh, this is a lot, a lot like my act. It, it has no point to it. <laughs> then I always get to laugh and I'll say, but it's also in case you like make a lot of mistakes, like not booking me for your company holiday party this year. Yeah. And I'll give those out. So I've, I've done a ton of different things over the years, uh, giving out, you know, the freebies, the brownies, the blue jays, you know, I used to use all those little sponge products that you give out to people. Um, you know, I do a, a really cool sponge ball routine. Um, I call them clown noses and I give them a, the kid a clown nose at the end. They also get a clown nose sticker that I actually stick on their nose. That's clever. Um, it's, you know, all kinds of stuff you can give out. Oh, cocktail napkins. I used to do the little rose cocktail napkins. Sure. Uh, spritz them with rose water and glycerin for the ladies. Right. So it even smells like a rose. So, Yeah. And especially, you know, what's what's great about that is I also give out things that brand the restaurant um, to go box stickers, um, you know, the, the cocktail rose napkin that has the restaurant's logo on it, uh, you know, matchbooks that have the restaurant's logo on it. Um, sometimes, it's, this, you know, the sugar packets are custom made. So I'm always branding the restaurant, too, as well, giving away things that uh, that will brand the restaurant. When you're working a corporate uh, event and let's say you're working for ABC Corporation, do you bring something from the XYZ restaurant that you would, let's say, you have a sugar packet so that's why you kind of promote the restaurant at corporate um, events? You know what I'm saying? No, I've never done that. Okay. You know, it's like, you know, because you're there working for the company pretty much and, you know, it's just it's like, you know, I, I, oftentimes, yeah, I don't hand out business cards at corporate events because I'm right. not there to get business unless right. they ask for one, of course, but. What's your thought uh, on tips? Different. What do you do when you when people you know, are people I, I just sometimes, at a corporate I, event. you know, <laughs> It's, you know, I just say it's not kind of necessary, weird, you know, I'm, I'm being paid by the company to be here. Yeah. Uh, you know, so unless I'm doing a trick with the bill, you know, and they say here, keep it. Then, you know, I, I'll, I'll, yeah, maybe I'll pocket it. But, but yeah, I, I try not to, you know, if I'm not soliciting tips in the restaurant, I'm certainly not going to solicit tips at corporate venues. <laughs> that gets back to the person that booked you. That might not, that might not bode very well. Uh, no, that's true. Uh, you know, I, when uh, the occasions that I've had that where they have uh, said to me at a corporate strolling event or something that if you would um, uh, accept tips and I'll say, well, no, I'm being paid handsomely. I'm already doing fine. So, well, you know, and they've got the thing out. It's like they're holding it. And if they put it back and I, I want them to put it back, you know, but if, but if they continue to insist, I kind of feel as if it's a rejection of their appreciation. Yeah. You know? now you don't want to offend the giver, uh, but you know, in the, in the restaurant setting, uh, the, the downside to that is that uh, they might feel like they might be able to assess your worth. You know, if they, if you mm -hmm. accept a five dollar tip, they think that what you make sixty dollars an hour. Uh, right. Or they might feel like they have the right to call you back over to the table. Uh, if the restaurant's busy, you might not be able to do that. So, uh, you know, those are some downsides to accepting tips. I remember talking with Charles Green the third many years ago when um, he was living back in Houston. That would have been in the uh, early eighties, I guess it was. Oh, yeah. And yeah, his great. at the time he was working nine to eleven different restaurants a week. Um, and his philosophy was exactly what you said right there, then Keith, as far as not wanting to accept tips from the standpoint, it's like, well, you know, and then when you, they call you and you say, it's going to be $2,500, you know, for this. So what, you, I just gave you $5. I mean, that then they equate in your mind per hour, what that should be. And it's like, right. that's nowhere near $2,500, you know? So right. you don't want to start setting an expectation. So I understand that. Um, I think in reality, though, that if somebody, again, wants to give you something of whatever value, it's five or 50 or 100 or whatever, that uh, if, if if they want to, then I think that that's fine. And uh, I, I think it's fine if supplementing your income with that uh, then as well. So I don't have a problem with taking taking the tips. Yeah. Yeah. And that's another thing on the, on the subject of, uh, of monetary compensation. 
Uh, when you're doing restaurant magic, you don't charge the restaurant, you know, what, like, of course like you typically you're there for a couple hours, you know, during dinner right. rush, you don't charge the restaurant the same amount that you would charge, you know, you would at a corporate venue, you charge right. a restaurant significantly, you know, substantial, uh, a, a substantial amount less than what you would charge for a corporate booking uh, because you're there on a weekly basis or a monthly basis, you know, and you're, um, you know, you're, you're getting gigs there and everything. So I just wanted to throw that out there in case, you know, somebody's interested in getting into restaurant magic. You don't charge the restaurant what you would charge a normal gig. So. No, and it varies also in most restaurants, but you have to take a look at what the cost uh, that they're probably incurring anyhow on a, uh, for their labor. In other words, uh, they're probably paying a minimum wage or often cases for uh, wage staff, something less because they encourage them to uh, work even harder for their tips. Uh, if they gave them minimum wage, then they make their their th thinking is well, they're not going to try hard. But if we give them less, they've got to make up for that, and they got to work harder, uh, kind of a thing. Likewise, that if you're working uh, as a uh, yeah, as a magician for a restaurant, I think that it should be certainly much more than what the minimum wage would be because you're providing a different kind of a service. You know. Well, also, I you know I always I tell people you know. Uh, and you know, like I talked about in my lecture as well, you don't want to charge them by the hour mm -hmm. because that's going to seem like a lot, you know, compared to what they're paying the waste staff. You want to charge them by a block of time, which is a two hour increment. So, um, or, you know, sometimes three, it depends. Like I, I've worked brunches before, uh, I worked four hours, uh, you know, on a brunch, like for Mother's Day or, or Father's Day or something like that as well. Um, but, you know, especially if the restaurant's busy, um, you know, sometimes you might end up working late as well, but, uh, but you always, always want to, uh, make sure you're charging by a block of time, uh, not by, not by the hour. That's a good point. And I agree with that, uh, from the standpoint that a lot of times I will be working a little bit, quote, overtime, let's say I'm working from seven to nine and I'm still there at nine 15. I don't go back and say, well, you owe me another, you know, X dollars for these 15 minutes of overtime yeah. because there might be someone who has just walked in or they were served late or they're having an issue or whatever. I kind of feel like that is part of the relationship you have then with the restaurant that right. they can depend upon you as being a valid employee, which goes back to, again, the the tipping thing. I had an issue with a uh, uh, one of the restaurants I worked with for a while in which you were talking about how that you would get uh, food at the end of the evening. Well, I would uh, get something to take home then as well. And when I did, I was, uh, um, it, it's, I was, uh, they were, uh, so I remember before they were initially giving uh, this to me uh, for free. Um, and then um, when I went into, uh, after a few months, went into get my check and the, um, the manager was saying, well, you know, you are a contract employee. Yeah. And as such, you, you, you uh, need to be uh, buying this just as anyone else would be. So in other words, you're mm -hmm. a customer, you're not an employee, you're, you're here on contract basis. Uh, mm -hmm. We can extend a discount to you, uh, but you know, it's not going to mm -hmm. be free. And wow. that was, it was something that wasn't in a contract or something. I had taken over this job from someone else who had had it before and they had this kind of arrangement. And um, I, I just think that for whatever reason that that, changed. And so mm -hmm. I said, well, I, I understand and that's fine. And so I just, you know, paid them whatever, uh, and, and continued on. But, uh, uh sometimes you, it, it made me start to think about how that I am not a server and I'm not a magician. I'm, as I said, a contract employee, I'm coming in. Mm -hmm. And so as such, I'm being paid at a much higher level than what the servers are being paid. And that's why you don't want to upset them either, obviously, because they know that you're getting something uh, better, but you are also helping them get a better tip if they are recommending you to come to this person's table and entertain them mm -hmm. because they have, um, they're having a, a good experience and that experience goes to including the, uh, the, service they've had from the wait staff. Mm -hmm. So as long as that they have been giving you good service and then they bring the magician over, it's kind of like, you know, I'm I'm your butler. I'm the person who's helping and assisting you, you know, mm -hmm. then they, they get a bigger tip. So I, I haven't in the past shared my uh, tips with the uh, on any percentage basis with the wait staff, which brings me to that question. Have, what are, are your thoughts on that? Do you think you should share them with the uh, wait staff or? Are you um, I do. Uh yeah, I mean, because, uh, you know, initially when you're, especially if you're starting out at a restaurant, you're going to be looked at as a threat. You're going to be looked at as competition mm -hmm. uh, for tips. You know, that the servers are looking at you as, as your tips are coming out of their percentage. 
Uh, even though, you know, it's interesting you, you talk about you're not, you're a contract employee or, or you're a magician. I look at myself as a, a PR uh, person for the restaurant. I'm a goodwill ambassador for the restaurant. Uh, I'm not there to do magic for people. I'm there to entertain the restaurant guests. Um, you know, if they need water refilled, if it's slow, I'll go fill, refill their water for them. Uh, they didn't get silverware. I'll go get the silverware for them. Uh, I learned the table numbers. So that way, if sure. there's a problem with a meal, instead of the restaurant comping uh, the dessert or the comping the meal, uh, they can send me to, to the table and say, hey, go to table seven. Uh, and I go to table seven. I know where that is. I don't have to say, well, where's table seven? It's the guy with the gray, green sweatshirt. And I look over and there's like three guys with green sweatshirts on, you know, like, mm -hmm. what's what? But, you know, especially on trial night or when I'm new at the restaurant, I will oftentimes give my tips to the servers, you know, to win them over to the, so that they understand that I'm a team player. You know, I'm not there as competition. I'm not there as a threat. But you're um, setting a precedent by doing that, I think, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, sometimes, if you know, you can tell. I mean, I, de I develop relationships, not with just the, the patrons and the guests, but the management and especially the wait staff. I get to know them. You know, I, they're having a hard time I'm making a lot of money at the restaurants i make a good living doing magic you know mm -hmm. a lot of times you know they're single moms they're struggling to make ends meet um you know it goes a long way um you know something else i do on trial night and even on a regular basis to this day um is somebody says you know they offer me a tip you know they hand me a five dollar bill and i'll say hey you know what i really appreciate that I'll tell you what would you do me a favor uh, instead of uh, in lieu of a, a gratuity, would you mind just telling the server, you know, or the manager or the owner on the way out that you how much you, you enjoyed our time together? Not how much you liked my magic or not how funny you think I was, but how much you enjoyed our time together. OK, mm -hmm. that's worth its weight in gold right there. And something else that I that I think like when I close my lecture, I always talk about what I think is the most important thing. If there's anything you take away from my lecture, it's I want it to be this. Learn people's names. Very important. When somebody gets up to leave my restaurant, if I'm in the middle of a set, I will stop and I'll take a few seconds and I'll say, hey, Tony, Deborah, thanks for coming out tonight. And this is what happens. They're like, he remembered our names. Mm -hmm. I, I don't remember his name. He remembered our names. And they will come back in the restaurant because I remember their name. And chances are, I will remember their name when I see him again. Not because I'm a smart guy, but because I just use a mnemonic like Harry Lorraine did. You know, and that that's one of my biggest pet peeves is when I'm at a show and I see a magician, first of all, not even offer a round of applause for the person coming up on stage as encouragement and appreciation. But they'll get, you know, they'll get the Rubik's Cube out and they'll hand the Rubik's Cube over to, to Sally and uh, they'll enter. Hey, I'm, you know, first of all, they'll ask them their name. I always reintroduce myself to the person. You know, I was introduced at the beginning of the show, but they're not going to remember my name. So I reintroduce myself. Then I ask for their name. I do that as in my table approach as well. I introduce myself. I greet them with a smile. You know, I make conversation with them. I make eye contact. Um, but when I see a magician up on stage or, you know, I say, what is your name? Sally. And then he starts twisting his Rubik's Cube and she twists her Rubik's Cube up. And 20 seconds later, he's like, I'm sorry, what was your name again? <laughs> I, I'm sorry, what is your name? You know, they That's lose horrible. me. First of all, they lose the audience right. because what does that tell Sally? What does that tell the audience? It tells them that you don't care. They might as well just be another Rubik's Cube up there because they're just another prop for you to do magic at. You know, you are there to do magic with people. You know, respect the audiences, respect it if it's a restaurant table or if it's a person on stage. They're they're allowing you because of them, you're able to do what you love to do. Show that love by remembering their name. Well, you're absolutely right, Stephen. Um, I think. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, oh I, I, I've told the story several times on the <laughs> podcast in the past, and that is where the first job that I got out of college was when I had gone into a room with uh, three gentlemen and I had shown them my portfolio from for an advertising agency that I was wanting to work for. Well, anyhow, they had um, uh, hired me and, and called me back and hired me. And they said, the reason we wanted to have you back is because you remembered our names. Everyone else who yeah. came in had good qualifications, but the deciding factor was you called us each by name. Cause as I left, I said, thank you, Mr. So-and-so. And, you know, all their names as I was leaving and that you don't know how important and how sweet the sound of your name is uh, until that actually affects you like that. And, and you see it on a regular basis when you're like at a cocktail 
cocktail party and you're walking away, you know, thank you uh, very much. Uh, like I say, you know, Tony and Melinda and glad to uh, have you guys uh, here to, and help with the magic. It's been great meeting you. And they look around and say, how does he remember our name? They may not remember the trick, but all of a sudden they have to start recalling all the stuff that you had done, because if he remembers my name, I should remember more about him. Who was that guy again? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And that's why they come back into the restaurant. I mean, sure. the most beautiful sound anyone can hear is the sound of their own name. Sweet and sound. when I'm performing in the restaurant, I'll use the person's name three, four times, you know, throughout the set while I'm there at the restaurant. And I do it on stage as well, because when a person's on stage, they're nervous. Yeah. You know, there's instructions to be had. There's processes, there's procedures they need to do. Uh, and when you when you say their name, you know, it redirects their attention, but also I think it, it puts them at ease as well because they know that you care. So right. that's another reason it's important to learn people's names. As we are actually Remember. reaching the end of uh, this, this episode in our discussion, I actually want to start at the beginning of what we probably should have uh, mentioned. That is about how you get these restaurant jobs and uh, going and approaching them. How do you find the right restaurant to go to and the right time of day or or which day of the week that you would mm -hmm. go and talk with the manager or the general manager or whoever's going to be doing the hiring. Um, yeah, that's, a, that's a real great point. Um, you know, the best time to go to a restaurant, uh, to prospect a restaurant is, uh, between 8 AM and 10 AM, uh, or between two and 4 PM, uh, Tuesday through Thursday. Um, you don't want to go on Monday or Friday because the restaurant manager are, are really busy at that point in time. Um, you know, you want to walk in, you want to have your suit on, pressed, you know, hair groomed, nails trimmed, shoes shined. Uh, you want to pr present a professional image. Uh, even if you're doing, you know, balloons or whatever, you're just, you know, working at a family friendly restaurant. Um, I always have a promo kit with me that has uh, like a one sheeter. It has some accolades in there. Uh, has my headshot. I have a sample of a lobby board of like what I'll be posting in the lobby of the restaurant so that mm -hmm. owners or managers can see that as well. Um, I also have a, a, a sheet that I think is the most effective thing in my promo kit. It's called Restaurant Raves. And what that is, is it's a, a page of paragraphs of what restaurant owners and managers have said about um, how I've brought business into the restaurant uh, and how much the guests enjoy uh, me being there, you know, Um uh, you know, sometimes they say, you know, Keith's a you know amazing magician, or let's say he's you know he's hilarious or whatever. But but that really kind of helps sell that to other restaurants as well. Um, and usually when you when you go in, you cold call. I mean, you can try to call a restaurant and leave a message for a manager. Uh, I can count on uh, one hand the amount of times I received a ret <laughs> return phone call exactly uh, from restaurant managers. Uh, they don't reply to emails either. Uh, and it's just because they're busy. I mean, they work eighty hours a week. You know, on average, they're just you know, they don't have time for that. That's why you really have to drop in and cold call the restaurant. Have one or two of your best effects with you. Uh, I don't even do magic at that point unless they ask. I want to be able to pitch the free trial night where I can go in for a couple of hours and let them see uh, me in action. Not necessarily me. You know, I tell them, I say, like, you know, watch uh, the experience that your patrons are having. You know, don't watch me, watch them laughing, watch them smiling. Uh, that's what's really going to sell uh, restaurant magic is, is the customer's uh, appreciation and enjoyment of what you're doing for the restaurant. That's good advice. One thing I had heard as a great tip from uh, Scott Hollingsworth, uh, who was a pioneer in uh, restaurant magic uh, decades and decades ago, it was where that he suggested that you would join networking groups where you would have food and beverage managers from hotels and restaurants and different places, because just like the Rotary, the uh, Lions Club or whatever groups of organizations have their luncheons or evening dinners or whatever, they have these get togethers monthly in which they kind of exchange different ideas and maybe employees or, you know, someone's moving from one company to the other. But of course, they're always looking as these other fraternal organizations are, they're looking for someone to give them uh, some speech or to talk a little bit. And so he said, that's a great place to showcase yourself because first of all, you, you, you join the group or you kind of get involved and then say, well, I'm a magician. I could provide a uh, program for you then as well, if you'd like. And then when you do, then that's a great place for you to be seen by the right people because they'll remember that then also. And you're showcasing for them because there might be some managers that you may not be able to get into because as you say, if you're just dropping in to see them, um, for a variety of reasons, you may not. Uh, uh, be able to get to see them that day might have to come the next day or next week. And even when you do, you may not get to show them those 
couple of great tricks. But if you actually have a 20, 30 minute window that you're showing and showcasing, I guess, to this larger group, you might have a, uh, with that wider audience might have a better opportunity. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I, uh, and not only that, but I, and when I first started out doing magic uh, full time, I mean, I, I joined a lot of chambers of commerce, uh, a lot of networking events. Um, I would join. I went to a lot of lo rotary clubs, lions clubs, um, just, you mm -hmm. know, networking, not even getting paid, but acting as if I was being paid. Like I'm working in the room, you know, at a networking event or a chamber of commerce, uh, you know, morning coffee, uh, as if I was working at a corporate gig, just passing out business cards, magically doing magic for everyone. And it's funny too, because now those chambers hire me to come to their mixers just to, you know, bring the wow factor, so to speak, you know, and now I'm getting paid to be there, but I'm also networking as if I was, you know, when I first started out. So. I have a friend who's a Rotarian who said the incoming president, international president, uh, this lady is coming in from Philadelphia, is going to be having as her theme for the new year, uh, magic. And okay. so uh, this lady who was telling me about that was saying, I'm just kind of giving you a heads up that you might want to pass this on to the rest of your listeners, because this might be an opportunity, certainly, that, uh, of course, the Rotary is always looking for different i mean each rotary club around your location your group will, will want to uh, hire you anyhow but they are particularly keen right now for going out and looking for magicians rather than you know just you showing up so they're right. going to be much more open to uh to seeing you and perhaps that could be a good showcase then as well not just at a local level but of course as you said then keith that they've got um, other kinds of uh, regional state and national and international uh, meetings in which that they do have a good budget for that yeah so, well, and you mentioned something too about, you know, they have a magic theme. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many events I've been to where the theme is magic. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, they, they reach out to Army the following year or a few years and they, and they have a different theme. And I, I can tie into any theme. That's one of the reasons I named my company Magic Creations. Uh, it's all one word with one C. Uh, I've actually coined the term magic comedy, all one mm -hmm. word with one C as well. Um, and that's what I, I present my uh, my general entertainment magic show is magic comedy, all one word with one C in quotes. Um, but I create magic based on what the client's needs are. So I have magic that I do for any holiday, like any theme you can imagine. Like I'm doing a St. Patrick's Day uh, corporate event tomorrow for a luncheon and I'm doing St. Patrick's Day magic, you know, with green mm -hmm. props, all, all the patterns scripted out for St. Patrick's Day. Um, that's why I do a lot of trade show work is because I'll promote the person, the company's product. Um, even if they don't have a, a tangible product I can manipulate and do magic with, I'll just communicate the key business strategies to that, uh, the potential clients, you know, at the trade show booth to stop traffic at their booth. Sure. So I think that's one of the reasons I, I'm, I've had the success I have, the modicum of success that I enjoy is because I put the extra time into creating magic, being creative is one of my you know, magic was my hobby for a long time. I had, it was my avocation before it became my vocation is that I can tie into anything Las Vegas nights. You know, it's almost sure. like I work with these companies. Some of them hire me every year. They're like, okay, let's see what you do with this theme. And I show up and they're like, <laughs> you are, they're so impressed that I can do a themed magic act, whether it's a stage show or parlor show or close up magic, you know, I can always tie into a theme. And that's why they go with me as opposed to just any other magician, because any other magician's just going to do, you know, general magic. And right. that's, you know, a bulk of what I do is just general comedy magic. But, um, you know, they, they mention a theme or they have a topic or, you know, I, I do a lot of keynote presentations as well. Uh, it's because of my ability to do that. So. Well, we've covered a lot of areas over here and I appreciate the time that you've given us. And I think we've reached pretty much the uh, end of our, our time for right now. I, but I always like to close by asking what uh, my guest's magic word is. What's your philosophy mm -hmm. of life? Mm -hmm. Well, Sean, that's a really good question. Um, <laughs> um, you know, my tagline is uh, making events magically memorable. Um, I've always used that, you know, I mean, I, I, I want, I want them to remember me, you know, like I, I can't tell you how many laymen I see at, especially in the restaurants. Like, Hey, we saw this, we saw this guy on a cruise ship, uh, did this, uh, this trick, this really great trick with this, uh, you know, uh, whatever it is, you know, he did this Rubik's cube trick. I'm like, Oh yeah. What was his name? And nobody ever, I think, that I can remember, ever remembers anybody's name, mm -hmm. you know? I want to be magically memorable. I don't want my magic to be magically memorable. I don't want my comedy to be magically memorable. I want me 
to be magically memorable. I mean, that's one of the reasons, like I just said, I, I create magic based on what the client's needs are. And I'm, I'm creative in that regard as people. I want people to remember me, uh, not just what, you know, one of my favorite quotes uh, is that, you know, people might not remember what you did, but they'll remember, always remember the way that you made them feel. Yeah, my uh, own so I always, you know, try to to engage people's emotions and and you know empathy and being sympathetic and just being vulnerable and uh, just making that connection with people, tripping the footlights, you know, getting people to care about you. If they care about you, because you know that they care about them, they're gonna they're gonna care about your magic and just gonna make your shows or your close up sets so love much that. stronger. That's a good way to uh, close. That's a good uh, thing to for people to think about. Uh, that as well. Keith, thanks very much. I appreciate your time and your thoughts and words. This has been great. And it's my pleasure. Thanks again for having me. So with the Magic Word Podcast, that was Keith Leff. This is Scotty Out. Well, thank you very much, Keith. I appreciate you being my guest here this week on the Magic Word Podcast. And I appreciate all the advice on so many areas that you had given us as a professional magician. And so I think other people will benefit from some of the words you had to share with us. So thanks again very much. I also want to thank our sponsor this week, which is the Wonder Bash coming up in Grand Rapids, Michigan, April the 18th through the 20th. Again, go check out their website at morethanmagic.com for more information to see who the, is on the lineup as well as to register right there. So please go check them out. Well, until next week, stay well, get booked, and remember to make your magic memorable. Then people will remember you. This is Scotty out. Scotty out.